Hey, what is going on, everybody? It looks like we got some folks here already. Uh, that's good to see. Uh, end of year special, boys and girls. And uh, as such, you know, this year has been a it's been a tailspin for most folks, except for the Sid back there with his 16 monitors. But for everybody else, they've been taking a beating and bruising, especially if you own Tesla. And so it's not been good. But we're going to talk about what 2023 has to offer, what the consensus looks like, and kind of what we're thinking. So if you're new to this channel, uh, and if you just clicked on this uh, on accident, um, we are a data analytics kind of heavy trading slash investing group here of people, like-minded folks that just try to bring that alpha from the market. We use a lot of alternative data sources. In fact, one alternative data source that we are looking at, that Mike was looking at the other day, is uh, <laughs> this one right here. So yeah, hey, boys and girls, we have Mike, we have Sid, Nathan, could not show up, but he did a video for us. He's going to be talking space stocks. I'm going to be talking defense sector. Sid's going to be talking about some rental stuff. And uh, Tad, the man of the people, T-A-double-D, uh, is going to elaborate when elaboration needs to happen. So with all that, let's go ahead and kick it off. I'm going to start with the first couple slides, and then I'm just going to kind of set you up for a general, you know, regular live stream. But then I'm going to go into the defense stocks. Uh, that's a big one, so I'll put that last. Uh, but right here... Boys and girls, when we talk about alternative data sources, like this is Signal right here, all right? As you can see here, uh, Mike had some cat puts, and then all of a sudden, all these cat hoodies showed up in uh, in uh, in Costco. I'm going to ask you this question, though, Mike. Uh, this kind of makes me uh, bearish. I mean, like, what, what's, what's, <laughs> well, why they got so much merch? Like, what's what's their game? Dude, you know? that, yeah, it's weird. I don't know. I guess... I don't know, man. Maybe product <laughs> diversification, man. Yeah. There's a lot of people yeah. who wear Caterpillar sweatshirts, man. It's a thing. So, and we love Costco because we love Jordan. So, um, yeah, you gotta, anything that's sold at Costco, man, I'm bullish on. So, so uh, I can't uh, to... let me just ask you this. So, when you saw those shirts, did the stock go up? Yeah, it's been hanging at around 240 the whole way, man. <laughs> so, oh, there we go. There we go. Yeah. Okay. But nice thing is I got those I got into those puts at 245. So I was I got a little nice print. So and now I'm waiting till next week. So um yeah, we'll see what happens. <laughs> Once those go on clearance, when they go on yeah. clearance, yeah. then I'll I'll load then my you're out, you're sure. out? Okay. I got I ain't gonna lie. I think just you know, visually thinking about this, like there's probably in some multiverse universe here, 0. 0.00001 correlation to, to somebody seeing this and then just some butterfly effect where that somebody saw a cat hoodie and the, and the stock price goes up, you know? <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, that's cool. Hey, what is up, Yamit and Fred? We see you in there. We see you in there. What is up? Hey, check this out. This is the analyst price targets for 2023 for the S&P 500. Mike, let me tell you. Your boy, Tom Lee, where do you think he's <laughs> – go ahead and read his price. You see it? You see it where he's at? It's sorted from highest to lowest, so it's going to be easy to find him. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, man. That's why I'm 250K BTC, buddy. You know what it yeah, is. Yeah, yeah. So you and him are like-minded. He's saying 4750 for 2023, which means from here you're probably rallying uh, continually. Uh, so, yeah. Hey, what's up, Michael? Michael's in the chat over here. Yeah, we got a slow day today, but uh, this is, you know, to be expected. The market's been punishing everybody. Plus, uh, yeah, this is a different Friday stream. Um, okay, I have Bank of America and Barclays uh, highlighted. Tad, why do you think I have those two highlighted? There's only one reason. Oh. Let's ask the people. Best. <laughs> what, what I'm going to bail you out. I'm asking you, Tad. <laughs> uh, well, maybe because they both start with B. Like my last name. <laughs> oh, no, I'll take that. Hey, uh, so we actually, uh, <laughs> in the beginning days of Redcliffe Research, where we were doing a lot of data integration, um, we, we basically uh, took a ton of price targets. I don't know if it was enough to be statistically significant, but we took as many as we could. So for analyst price targets, for kind of macro price targets, Barclays is actually the best. Uh, so Barclays is showing 37.25. It's really high uh, accuracy, actually. And then BOA is second uh, from, our, um, from our kind of deep dive. So Barclays has always been the best, so we always weight them really high. Uh, and then BOA is second. Uh, 
Uh, Fundstrat for a while was crushing it in a bull market, but when it's not a bull market, Fundstrat is not the place to get good macro research. Well, you know what? That's not true because, you know, I think they have uh, what's uh, their, um, their two kind of uh, analysts. Uh, one is, um, gosh, I forgot both of their names right now. Uh, are you talking mm-hmm. about the TA guy? Yeah, the TA guy, but the other dude too. He's pretty good. Uh, Brian Rauscher. Yeah, good. yeah, yeah. And Mark Newton. Yeah. I, I hey, Richard say- Sampson's I- here. Okay, I would say their macro is not bad, but their projection is not good. So I think the way that they extrapolate the data, um, I think they're just a little too optimistic and maybe they're just not looking at the blind spots, but their quant stuff's pretty good, man. I just think their predictions are just yeah a little off, but I don't know. Maybe they just have too much exposure to CNBC. Now, if you pull out their like their quant and you like break it down yourself, it's pretty solid, man. Pretty solid. Pretty solid. Um, but you got to break it down yourself, which is unfortunate because, you know, when they do the breakdown, you got to read in between the lines, uh, kind of what they're saying. It's kind of weird. It's kind of weird. Hey, Bem's here. What's up, Bem? We're getting some, we get some people. Yeah, it's Friday, Bem. I know we usually do this on Saturday, but this is a year end special. Mike said tomorrow is somebody special in his life birthday. So can't mm-hmm. be here. And we needed to have Mike for sure. <laughs> hey, I couldn't have been here yesterday tomorrow either, man. It's my anniversary, dude. 31 oh, years. Yeah. Really? Oh, nice. 31, wow. man. Congratulations. Dude, I'm making you got married when you were 10? I'm making her take me to dinner. Oh. <laughs> You're making so if you got married when you were 10, she was like one years old or something. You're close, bro. <laughs> dude. All right. Hey, um, SP 500 is uh it's not worth trading here. Um, I usually day trade the S&P 500. Um, you guys know that. You know that I have uh, kind of some systemic uh, ways to trade it. But, you know, based on what I've been seeing, it's just not worth trading here. If you're if you're going to do anything, you got to be short here. And if you're short here, then you're just waiting to get your teeth busted. Um, I eat Tesla the other day, although I still think Tesla has more downside. Um, so, you know, kind of the high conviction things that I'm looking at, we'll talk about it. Uh, at the end of the stream, basically Bitcoin and Tesla, um, and not to the upside. But anyways, S&P is not worth trading here. The second thing I'll say is, you know, if you look at all this simple moving averages here, all the way up to the 300, uh, it's below. So under pressure, again, once again, uh, there is no strength here in the S&P 500. Dominant trend still going down. And the recession is still going to, it's going to, it's going to give the one, two punch, uh, <laughs> <laughs> to earnings, man. So the companies, there's going to be companies that, boy, you better have good DD. Uh, you better be betting on things like AMD uh, to get you out of this. What was that? I said <laughs> AMD. I said AMD long. I said $78 price target. So <laughs> what was your price target, Sid? Like 45? Uh, pretty close. Whatever, okay. whatever Sid hits his price target, that's what I buy. Uh, just to be honest. So here's some uh, relevant Jamia news, since I know folks who watch this channel uh, kind of pop on here. Check out Jamia. Uh, Jamia is moving all the top bosses from Africa uh, to Africa from Dubai. Because uh, you know what? Dubai office space is way too expensive. And um, you know what? You cannot manage the people from the ivory tower. So that's a big deal, man. That's a huge deal. Uh, it's one of the first things that you're going to be able to do to start seeing things happen. And I think I like it. Two other things that I want to mention here is Amazon.com is planning to expand into Africa as soon as next year. That said, uh, Dufay, which is the CFO turned temporary CEO, uh, said the company has more than 10 years of experience operating in Africa, given its advantage over the new competitors. Jimmy has be- built logistics from scratch due to the lack of formal business uh, business addresses, et cetera, et cetera. Um, I'm telling you, the only reason I see this scramble to bring everybody to Africa is to make them more appealing for a buyout now. Um, I really feel like this is a mad scramble. I don't want to put the Amazon brand against the Jumia brand. And you got to think about like Jamia CapEx spend. What you want to do is take CapEx spend since inception and look at how much of that would cost Amazon, right? So is it cheaper to acquire here? 
Likely. Is there a good chance of acquire? Likely. Uh, if they don't do it within the next, gosh, year, uh, it's gonna be a it's gonna be a fist fight. Which I'm not saying like Jamia is in trouble here, but Jamia Pay is gonna have to really carry some serious serious water um, for them to to have any USP outside of like what they're doing for Africa. Uh, in terms of like the just logistics chain that they could sell to Amazon. Anyways, just some quick thoughts on that. Anybody have any thoughts on that? I know I don't know if you all are watching this, but just wanted to highlight some news. I'm just telling you that my cost basis is eighteen dollars. So that's all. <laughs> so I mean, if they get bought out, out there, if they uh, get bought out, I, I if they get bought out, I think you see twenty. Like you'll come out on top. Yeah. Hey, it's a buy. Fingers crossed. <laughs> Fingers crossed. Am I have? <laughs> Let me just let me just ask for the people. So what you're saying is, you know, the markets obviously the market's been going down. Yes. If you want to take a risk, this could be a little extreme. Since last time I checked Jimmy out was at I don't know, three something a share. I don't know what's at now. Is that is that what it's at? Yeah, it's about like three something. Now might be a time where you can go big because I, I, or maybe wait until the market drops a little bit more and then maybe go big, but it'd be kind of, yeah, I mean, look, if they get acquired here, no matter what, if your bet is on an acquisition, this is a good time to buy. Like it's not even, I mean, price to book, you're at 1.25 price to book, meaning like if you liquidate everything they have now, even without the IP, um, you're going to get your money back. So I don't see how much farther it can go down. Even in bankruptcy, you're going to get some of this back. Um, so, I mean, you're, you're there. Um, the, I guess the point that I'll make is, and, you know, Nathan's going to make, uh, I don't want to spoil it, is, uh, you know, these companies do get acquired. Um, look at Maxar. Um, and again, I won't, I won't spoil it because I got, I got Nathan here on video, but yeah, man, it's, it's uh, for me, I have a lot of exposure. So anybody with a lot of exposure, sh should you get your cost basis down? I can't tell you that, but you know, I'm trying to, um, but I'm not as aggressive as I could be, but I think that's because there's a lot of other places to deploy money. So, you know, you don't have to, you don't have to do anything. If you have some Jamia, I'm a holder, I'm a holder here, you know? Um, can you add? Yeah, absolutely. Hmm. Woo! All right, sit. Is you all right? So, so what we're looking at this year um, at our family office um, is uh, RVs rentals. Um, also, looking at um, trying to think of it now off the top of my head, I can't think of it. Um, silver, gold, gas, and oil storage units, single family rentals, anything rental basically. RV rentals are one of the biggest things we're looking at. Um, the prices are dropping on those. Um, one of the ones we did this year, um, on it was, uh, I think we paid around 27,000 for it in the first four months of peak season this summer. Um, we did over, um, $10,000 net on it and that was hands off. It means it's totally passive. Somebody else sets it up for us or you can have it set up at, at, a you know, a, a place near, near you and just leave it there. Um, we don't do it that way. We, we set it up or we have somebody take it and drop it every day for us or every time there's a, a rental completely hands off for it. So that those are good investments that we're looking at this year. Um, I know RVs kind of sound sim, si, simple or silly, but man, it's uh, just so simple. It, it, it's just it. It's just so simple to do. On the silver side, you know, we're, we're still piling into physical. Um, we are now taking a broader look. I think there's still going to be a downturn in the physical um, price. Um, of gold and silver before we take off into 2023, maybe after the first quarter. Um, but there's a huge demand for silver and gold, especially silver. So in the comics in New York, um, this year there was 140 million ounces. Now there's only 33 million ounces left. So there's a huge drawdown on the thousand ounce bars um, from the very wealthy that are taking their money out, getting ready for, um, that's a longer story, but let's we'll just say they're getting ready for something that um, I believe will will come at a certain time. Also, um, some of the stocks that I'm looking at is uh, WPM, GGN, Gold, AEM, REO, SJT. And just as a side note, too, 
India alone as a country purchases over 30 million ounces of silver a year. So that already magically puts us into a 250 million dollar deficit for the year of 2023. So I think silver is, is a, a strong play. If not, it's a defensive play. If anything, it, even if it doesn't go up, it's still a defensive play. Um, the uh, storage units, one of the ones that we're looking at right now is a 69 unit. Um, that'll gross us this year about 90,000. Um, net on that will be about 69,000. Uh, I'm didn't. i not going into the details of purchasing it, setting it up, are you buying a new one or are you, are you building one? But that was one that we're, we're looking at um, this year that'll this coming year that'll pull the trick will pull the trigger on already um so we're excited about that and, and to me the other important thing is guys and girls that are out there make sure you have cash on hand don't put it all into the comp into the in market or any investment at this time i still think overall things are going to go lower and um if you want to start playing around and not playing around but investing in some long-term stuff go ahead and do that but don't don't shoot all six so all six shots in one time save some um you want me to hold out for the defensive socks yeah, yeah. that's a six right. shooter reference if y'all didn't know because he's like yeah. old school you know i'm old school like, buddy six shooter hey, well, while, I'm, while i'm here i just want to shout out to uh, mighty ox trading um it's on youtube they do a live uh futures trading every uh, morning um great bunch of guys just getting started over there um it's, Good place to hang out and just kind of learn what's going on in the futures market if you have any interest in it. Sweet. Hey, thanks, Sid. Um, let me answer some questions here. I see a lot of talk in here, and I want to, I want to, I want to, I want to chat with the people. Tad, let's chat with the people. Who? What do we got to say? Uh, okay. First, Yemet wow. says she thinks that uh, Tesla will see one thirty, and then low again. Uh, Yemet, yeah, actually, if Tesla. And you know I'm a Tesla bear. You know this. Uh, if Tesla breaks 120, I actually think there is a good probability it stays above 120. So 120 is kind of like the land, line in the sand for me. So what I want to see for short is hits 120 and then starts breaking down again. And then I'll, I'll, I'll revisit my short and work its way down towards 90. But if it breaks 120, you're probably in okay shape. Because to do that uh, would mean you're going to get some good earnings numbers coming up and good delivery numbers, which are coming right across, I think next month. So yeah, I mean, I think there's a case to be made. I'm the eternal bear right now, but uh, I mean, Elon is just uh, unraveling himself in front of everybody. And that's literally the last piece of the sentiment puzzle with uh, Tesla. And we did say a long, long time ago, you know, this market's not done correcting until Tesla, uh, contracts a little bit, especially now that they can't uh, get the deliveries out the door and China is kind of, you know, um, been kind of uh, trampled on, uh, reference COVID, reference the lockdown. Um, go through some more. Ooh. What do you think about that one? <laughs> Nat Gas. Nat Gas is really, really interesting. On the one hand, you know, when we talk about Europe and we talk about like the constituents that need the most natural gas, um, it's kind of a it's definitely a kind of um, scarce, scarce asset, if you will. But in America, the nat gas companies, the ones that we can buy in terms of like the way that we can capitalize on this, um, they don't do a lot of deliveries overseas, not, not from the ones that I was looking at. So it's a, it's a difficult arbitrage play. Um, so I don't have a good way to actually play this. And the way that I actually play this more is I think the natural gas kind of inefficiency increases with colder winter and with more war. So hear me out on this. So nat gas, colder winter, more war. The proxy play that's more safe is probably more defense sector names, which I know is a silly roundabout like way to do it, but I don't see a ton of I mean you can you can play natural gas. In fact, dude, hold on a second. No. Mike, what Sorry. do you think about that? I got to look up. I'm going to check out the sentiment engine behind me real quick to see. Uh, well, no, it's just, dude, uh, just look at the look at the chart, man. It's crazy. It went, um, let's see. It started at 12 a year from today, last year. And then it went all the way. I'm, t I'm looking at UNG, by the way. Sorry. No, no, I know. I know. I know. Because it was the play that we set up early. 
Yeah, it's crazy. It went all the way up, and then now we're literally lending back flat, man. So I don't know. It's crazy. I mean, it looks like a pretty good play to me, um, but I, I don't know the uh, the macros as well as you do. Um, everybody kept talking about a cold winter. We don't have enough natural gas. Europe was well um, the- freaking out, and so um, I don't know if that was just kind of like a, you know um, – FUD. Uh, so then the sell off the last like literally three, two, actually just the last month, man, it draw, drew down like 50%. So yeah, I don't know, man. I don't know the sector. I don't know natural gas sector as well as you do um, and the macros and stuff like that. So um, I knew our, when we originally uh, were very bullish on natural gas, it was when Russia invaded Ukraine. Mm-hmm. And now, I mean, it's, they're still there. Um, that part hasn't so changed is, very much. This is I just pulled up our sentiment engine for natural gas. This is natural gas by search volume. The, the only thing that I'll say is, as you can see here, like when we wanted to take our position, there was two two places where we we took positioning. Right? It's uh, am I showing my screen? Sorry, I'm not showing my screen. Of course not. No. There you uh, go. Okay, so this is this is the sentiment engine showing natural gas. Um, this is volume intensity for um, literally. We scrape like literally every article in the world. Uh, every news station, broadcast, TV, everything. And then we run machine learning against it to solve for a bunch of things that we care about. And this is showing natural gas intensity. So, you know, these correlate almost to the stock price per se. But uh, the histogram, this is has a huge smoothing score because the histogram is really dirty. Uh, but there's two spots here that, you know, if you bought, you were doing really well. Uh, what, I'm, what I'm saying is, you know, even though the, the, the price is screaming higher, um, like trend down still in terms of the people that are talking about it. So, you know, while not the perfect thing, like this is usually a good proxy of like, is it catching traction? Like are people talking about it? Is it a concern? And, and the, the lower it goes, the less concern. But do recall 2020 and 20 before that, there was no concern at all. So it's still at elevated levels, but I'm just saying that right now, like if you go to like places in Europe, people are just turning off lights and stuff, man. They're trying to save on natural gas. So I don't know what that looks like. Like, does it does it mean that people just don't even have money for that kind of stuff? It's, it's just really weird, right? So um, all I'm saying is like looking at the chart, and I actually haven't, haven't looked at the chart today. Uh, What's it look like, Mike? You looked at the chart, right? Yeah. Are you talking about UNG? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I mean, it literally is a, uh, it's like, what is it? Like a, like an inverse W. (laughs) So up, down, up, 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 and then all the way back down. So. I gotcha. No worries. All right. Yeah. Now, um, again, it's hard. It's hard to, it's hard to pick out that play. Let me see. Let me, let me check that out real quick fast the ung chart um while i'm here um you want me to share well that share the yeah yeah go ahead i can I'm, I'm taking a look right now yeah it's just as it breaks down here yeah it, it makes sense as you can see the sentiment engine like this breakdown here is is relative like if you're asking like does it does it bounce i don't think so man i don't think so Oh, I can't share. Sorry, buddy. I think it hits 12. I think I got it right here, man. Oh, okay. I think it hits 12, man. I think it hits 12. Like, there's no reason why yeah. it would right? It does um, look like it's going to hit 12. The uh, You you could trade where I've, I've traded or I wouldn't trade it, but I would own it. And I have owned it for the last uh, eight or nine months now is a uh, natural gas company in the States called ET, um, Energy Transfer Company. They pay a great dividend. They're inexpensive stock. I picked it up in the $6 range and I've been holding it ever since. Mm. Yeah, she's gone sideways for a minute here. Uh, It's good. What is it? Was a great place to hide for this year for dang sure. Um, Okay. Yeah. So that's natural gas. Uh, I saw Bem say something that I wanted to respond to too before we had uh, (laughs) the Kiyosaki moment. Yeah, I don't know, man. Yeah, Kiyosaki Um, moment. Uh, oh no! Here he goes. Would anything work uh, without JP slowing down? Yeah, man. Watch defense sector stocks. They've been they've been they've been busting. Uh, you'll see. We're gonna get into that in a second. But before I do that, uh, Mike, you're up, brother. Oh, okay. Um. So, uh, this entire year um, has been all about inflation. 
and uh, everybody's been trying to figure out uh, where it's going and whether or not we've peaked. And I think people have just kind of the markets reacted, man, viscerally to it um, with every CPI data point. And so uh, we've had uh, now two straight months of uh, decreasing CPI numbers. And this coming month um, is going to be big. And so I would say that, um, and I said this in our short, uh, in the short that I made probably about a month ago, um, I think inflation is going to be a nothing burger moving on. Um, I think, uh, in fact, I think the Fed is going to be a nothing burger uh, moving on. Uh, I think this coming year, 2023, as you can see, a lot of the big name banks um, and financial companies are um, forecasting pretty much a flat S&P uh, for 2023. And I think part of it is they're, um, uh, they're pricing in a recession. Now, I mean, I don't know if I would put too much currency into their projections. Um, I mean, we're obviously going to be somewhere a little above that or below it. I don't know. Um, but I would say that moving forward, I think you're not going to hear too much of a or inflation uh, focus anymore. It's going to be the effects of quantitative tightening from the Fed. And so um, if I were you, uh, I would really uh, hold on to cash. I was actually talking to a buddy uh, just right now um, before we came on. He was asking um, whether or not he should sell his, uh, his equity stake in, I think, some digital company. And I said to him that um i mean if you believe if you're like really bullish on it just hold but if um if you're not really convinced i would get out and just hold on to cash uh for now um unless you know um yeah i'm just i'm a big fan of just kind of holding on to cash right now because i think it's a good um i think it's good to be liquid right now especially in this market so um in terms of stocks like that i would pick uh right now Honestly, I wouldn't really pick anything other than um, I think energy is pretty strong right now. It looks pretty strong, um, although XLE could go either way. Um, I mean, a lot of the um, a lot of the energy names, SLB, Exxon, um, uh, Valero, they're kind of stretched to the upside. But you got to also take into account for the last like you know, five, six years, they've gotten shellacked um, uh, because of tech. You know, a lot of people have been putting so much money into tech. And so this coming year, um, I'm kind of, I, I think the way I'm playing it is I'm just, you know, kind of day to day, just reading the charts and things like that. But I'm a seller on, I'm a seller on uh, spikes. Um, so not that I'm bullish or bearish, but um, I think there's just a lot of premium and a lot of alpha that could be taken off of, or could that could be taken from the market and, and puts, especially with the recession in play. Uh, so until I see a a uh, a movement towards positive growth and relative to GDP and um, unemployment, uh, I'm going to stay pretty flat, um, and I'm going to sell rips. Um, so. Uh, I'm not really bullish on anything. Um, I mean, I am relatively bearish right now on tech uh, just because I think there's definitely more earnings compression that could happen. Uh, so, you know, and I think, uh, yeah, I don't know what to think about Tesla yet. Their P ratio is still about 35, 34. Um, I, I still think there's more room to downside. It looks like it wants to go down to 90. Uh, however, Elon's kind of a black horse, man, or dark horse. You never know what's going to happen there. So, you know, I mean, just in the last day or so, stock went up like 20%. So, I don't know. So, okay. anyway, all that to say, uh, trades that I'm in, I really like SIDS uh, trades uh, or SIDS uh, picks in terms of uh, gold and silver. Um, I like silver a lot, uh, especially because it's a pretty big conductor for a lot of uh, if you're like really bullish on uh, energy conservation and EVs, uh, silver seems like a pretty good uh, way to go. Uh, it's a pretty big conductor for a lot of the EV companies. Um, and so 
Gold has been shellacked for a while too. I think it's ready to come back up. Um, uh, defensive companies, I don't, um, I don't know too much about the sector yet, to be honest. I'll let Kenny and Sid talk about that. Uh, but a trade that I'm looking to get into is I'm looking to short Caterpillar. Um, so I'm waiting. Um, I'm waiting bigly. And I think it's kind of a scary play because I think a lot of people are going into um, – high beta names uh with strong dividends and uh strong balance sheets and cash flow and caterpillar is really really strong uh but i also think that the stock market doesn't necessarily reflect all of that stuff so um yeah so we'll see um i do like in terms of tech companies i still love amd sorry Sid. <laughs> uh i do like the semiconductors but there's a lot of headwinds coming in i think um and uh yeah i i i'm waiting for the, the this next quarter see what the earnings compression is going to look like i do definitely see some more uh downside um i do think i was talking to danny b about this um that they're the santa rally um i don't know uh we were expecting it to happen the last few days i think it's going to be a little bit of delayed i think we're going to get a short-term rally in january and i'm going to sell that thing so i believe that we're probably going to hit I want to say uh, SPY 393, 4-ish. And uh, what is that on XPX? Maybe uh, 39, I don't know, 39.70 or something like that. So, um, and then I think we're going to possibly make the next leg down. Um, but that is contingent on the earnings. Um, and I do think that we're going to have bad earnings this coming quarter. For some stocks. Uh, okay. I tend to agree with some of the stuff that you say, some of the stuff for me, uh, you know, I have a high conviction on, so I'm, I'm just going to leave it at that. Uh, but other than that, the clarification though, you're saying the Fed is going to be a nothing burger. That's because uh, you think they're going to do less, right? They're going to be more neutral. I think, kind of, okay. So, uh, because if they tighten, are you still saying they're going to be no nothing burger in the tightening cycle? No, I think they're going to, I think they're going to probably pivot in, um, what to say, maybe another four months. And then I think that's going to be the bottom of the market. Cause usually when the fed, when the fed pivots, the market bottoms out. So, um, I think they're going to be a nothing burger because everybody's reacting to what they're doing in terms of quantitative tightening. I think moving forward, I think, uh, I mean, I don't know what he's going to do. I have no idea, but, um, if you're a, um, you know, uh, if you're paying attention to what's happening in the economy, um, and again, the market is not necessarily the economy, um, but Jay Powell is reacting to a lot of the data. Um, I do think yeah. that you're going to see some um, some uh, uptick in the unemployment rate. I think you're going to see some compression in uh, GDP growth, um, and I think that uh, this housing market. Um, you're going to see some compression in uh, housing sales. And I think that's going to have a trickle down now. I don't think it's oh, going to be a crash. That's happening. Huh? Hey, how yeah. much is uh, how much is like a loaf of bread where y'all live? In California? <laughs> like, <laughs> or the, in the Vietnam? White bread, like white sandwich <laughs> bread, sandwich bread, like normal stuff like kids take on the lunch. Well, bed. I'll buy mine at Costco so I could get two loaves of bread for five bucks. Yeah, it's about right. So, yeah. so like. You know, like at Walmart, when like four or five years ago, before I left here for Germany, it were like a buck. You can get some of times like eighty nine cents per for like a, a thing of bread. Can you still do that? I can remember like when bread was twenty five cents a loaf. <laughs> yeah, I know. I'm saying though, like I'm not in America. I'm saying right now, I pay like like three seventy five, you know, for that. So I'm just wondering, you know, what that looks like over there for y'all. I don't. I don't see that. Right. Kevin, real, real quick, a couple of things that Fred, Fred and uh, Yamit have been talking about, about Kathy Wood and energy. So, Yamit, what I think she's talking about there, a 30% decrease in energy sector, um, that's only if we go into a recession. If, if there's no recession, that's not going to stop. It's going to continue to go up. Yeah. And, I, I yeah, so just further in what uh, Sid is saying, I think the recession that we're going to see is not going to be – as bad as what everybody else thinks it's going to be. 
So I think it's going to be a healthy low market pullback. And um, like I said, uh, I think the economy is a different beast uh, today. Um, I think it's super malleable. I think it's super adaptable. Uh, and I think you're going to see maybe an uptick in unemployment. I think, and then I think uh, because of innovation, technology, and um, the skills that people have and the malleability of the job market, I think you're going to see a recovery pretty quick. So okay. I have I have high hopes in 2024. Man, so. you like the labor market right now. I don't know. A couple, I do a couple, know. couple more things real quickly, too. Go ahead, Kenny. Sorry. No, go ahead, Sid. I, I was just going to say, somebody mentioned something. I think it might have been Yamit. I'm not sure. It was mentioning something about the healthcare. So when we get to the end, I, I got a couple of healthcare stocks that we're liking this year. And um, um, again, I, I'd like to add a little thing to what Mike was saying. I, I think the Fed may is going to pivot, but then they're going to pivot back because I think our, our, our CPI is going to hit 10% and they're going to have to, they're going to have to do it again. So we'll see what happens. Let me put it this way. I think the fed is so dumb right now. Like <laughs> not dumb, but let me, let me, they're so, it's so, it's so straightforward right now. Like it's so this, the ship is so slow. Let's put it that way. It's so bureaucratic. I don't want to say dumb. It's so bureaucratically slow that like stuff has to break before they can pivot. And I don't see anything breaking except for Bitcoin, which, by the way, you know that like real money doesn't care about Bitcoin or the price of Bitcoin. Um, so, you know, outside of like FTX and that debacle, that's the only thing that's broken so far. So we still need to wait for things to break. So I'm holding my breath. I don't I mean, I think if we pivot, it's like June, July. So. All right, I'm going to play this. This is Nathan. He was supposed to be here live, but he got sick, uh, but he recorded this for us. It's like a five-minute video. If you like space, space stock, stick around. Listen to what he's got to say. Whoops. Did I mess that up? Sorry. Let's try it again. All right. Had it. Sorry, I can't. of what's been going on in the space industry over the past year. So actually not that many things. It was a rather quiet year, uh, all things considered. Um, I would say the first thing that happened uh, noteworthy was the Artemis 1 launch. So NASA finally launched their big orange rocket uh, via Orion Space Capsule, went around the moon. And it is incredibly overpriced. There are only going to be a precious few number of launches before the program is canceled. But in the meantime, it is likely to generate a lot of hype, interest in the space industry. Uh, it's a full market for people to really consider the hype to you know, go beyond. Um, but the next thing that happened <laughs> this year was Astra absolutely collapsed. And the only thing I have to say to that is fucking finally. Um, how much did how much did Astra go down this year? Get the year to date. Oh yeah. Minus ninety-three point six percent. Um, we started the year at six dollars seventy-five. Now we're at a whopping ooh, forty-three cents. Um, yeah, they're getting delisted real soon. I don't know when, but <laughs> they're getting delisted. And the next thing is Maxar Technologies. Uh, Maxar was a stock uh, that we've been very interested in uh, for a while. Uh, they gained a lot of popularity for publishing satellite imagery of uh, Putin's movements in Ukraine and they have actually been taken private. Um, so anyone who was holding Maxar woke up to a very pleasant surprise a few weeks ago, seeing a 125% jump in a single day. Yeah, they got acquired for over twice their market value at the time. Uh, but I'll leave this uh, recording with a company that you guys should all keep an eye on, and that is OrbitFab. Um, this year, 
uh, I was able to do a lot of interviews of different you know, people of importance in the space industry. And I would say the most impressive one was Daniel Faber, the CEO of OrbitFab. Uh, now, OrbitFab, it's not a public company yet, um, still very early stage, but they might be going, um, doing some sort of public offering on the Spaced Ventures platform. Uh, it's a platform to help you know raise capital um, for space companies in very early stages. So we might see some sort of offering on that platform, but OrbitFab is focused on in-space refueling, like gas stations in space. And now this makes a lot of sense and a lot of companies really aren't, you know, giving this the weight that it deserves. Because when you think about um, what reusing rockets has done for the industry, like, you know, you wouldn't throw away a 747 every time you fly across the country. Um, reusing rockets has brought down the cost of space travel by orders of magnitude. Um, and it only makes sense to extrapolate that and start, you know, reusing satellites because, you know, there's still like microscopic, you know, drag and various gravitational effects, which means satellites don't like live forever if you put them in space. You know, the ones in low or orbit last like five years and then they slowly come back down and then they burn up. Um, and those satellites can be expensive. Like if you have like a $500 million asset up there, you can either replace it every, you know, 10 years, or you could refuel it um, with OrbitFab for maybe $20 million. Um, and then you're spending $20 million every five to 10 years instead of half a billion. Um, so there's a massive potential for this company. Um, and it's a very near term thing. It's not like a 10 year horizon thing. It's like very right now. Um, and it could mean a very large shift in the space industry. You know, if satellites are no longer seen as expendable, if they can be refueled, it'll incentivize companies to build more advanced satellites, um, larger ones, you know, a bigger capital investment, um, considering it won't have to be thrown away on a regular basis. Um, and we could see some pretty large development. So I would keep an eye on Orbit Fab um, just going into the next year. Uh, but that's all I have for you right now. Um, hope the live stream is going well. I'll send it back to Kenny. See ya. All right. That was Nathan, uh, our very own. He's been really busy being a Harvard student, so he hasn't been able to really participate that much, but always like to get his take on stuff. Uh, yeah. If you want to get an early stage and apologies for the video, he sent me a video. This is not video, obviously it's not working, but uh, yeah. Check out uh, his channel, Launch Window Research. Um, it does have a lot of that stuff going on. All right. Let's get into the traditional defense stocks. Okay, so this is consensus. I just pulled up a bunch of kind of, uh, hey, what are the top stocks? What are the top defense stocks? And for the most part, I don't agree with much of, uh, of folks because, you know, categorically, well, okay, let's put it this way. It's it's safe. Some of these defense names are what you would think typically of defense names for defense spending. But I would suggest that defense, uh, when it comes to the modern day defense and how it's kind of structured, uh, spending allocations for the government, big DOD, national strategic policy is going to shift. And it's going to shift really fast and really hard. And if you're going to miss that boat, you might miss that boat. So here's some thoughts. All right. Hardways, hardware is a one-trick pony. Uh, only uh, only scale substantially with budget allocations and like actual war, right? So if you're thinking about planes and all that other stuff, like those planes, uh, they only going to be uh, there's a cap, right? So like even if like somebody gets a huge uh, contract to to build the next generation of fighter pilot fighter wing aircraft, right? It's fixed wing aircraft. Um, there's there's a really tough scale to that. And there's a couple pieces to that because one, the government won't overpay for margins, right? So like typical margins on that is like car uh, company margins, manufacturing margins, 15% is like max, right? But when it comes to scaling other things, software as a service, when it comes to consulting, those kind of contractual things for defense or DOD, when I'm talking defense, I'm talking about DOD here. Those are the things that we want to take a look at. So the defense names, that I think benefit the most, and this is point number two that I'm going to try to make, uh, are the ones that benefit from what we call the threshold threshold prior to conflict. And one of my mentors, uh, Duan Lee, if you want to look him up, uh, he's written a lot of great pieces on this. But essentially, 
Um, one of the things that he postulated is like, you know, if you plot, if you do a dot plot on like when war happens, like in the last post-World War II, we just don't actually get to war, right? Except for Ukraine. Ukraine has literally been the outlier, right? Um, so the gray zone and the hybrid warfare zone are the places that companies and the government is spending. We're spending a lot of money on not going to war, which is where I want to focus my eye on in terms of being an analyst and looking at where we can get the most returns. So again, consultant heavy firms can scale fast because the margins are fierce in the defense sector. And what I mean by that is you can outbid a lot of folks for a lot of monies uh, on some contracts. Um, government contracting is super lucrative, especially if you're small. If you're big, it's still super lucrative because you can get these contracts where uh, they're only written for you and you can't <laughs> I mean, I'm not saying sole source, that's different, but like they're only written for maybe a handful of companies who can actually scale or actually fulfill the client needs uh, to even to even talk to the hiring manager. Right. So that's just one. Uh, and the cost, <laughs> this is this is crazy. Um, there's companies, most companies, I'm not going to say any names, but I know this because, you know, I was a, I've done contracting on both sides of the fence, like on the DOD side and on the other side. They don't pass that money on to. So, for instance, if if we have, uh, for instance, in in, in uh, I'm, I'm just gonna be really cagey here because I can't say names, NDAs, and all that stuff. But like in the DoD side, under a command, if that command sees that like everybody's working later and later, and they're working overtime, and they want to uh, pay those guys some more, and like we have like extra monies uh, in the pot of monies. Um, like unfunded resources, you cannot pay those workers. You can give it to the company. And we found out most most <laughs> fiercely that when you give it to the company, the company doesn't give it to the people. They literally just send it back uh, to their coffers. Anyways, that's just a side. But software as a service for the DOB is going to be superior here from what I'm seeing. And DOG has just started modernizing. So we would call this early ramp cycle. Uh, so they're still working their data protocols and data processes. So with that said, we have a bunch of companies that I want to look at, but I'm looking at only really three companies right now for today's deep dive because I don't want to go into depth. Uh, I do have one of the names is going to be a hardware company, though. Uh, so look at a few names. Don't want to be too diversified here. Positioning here. So if you're asking me how I'm playing this, how I'm playing the defense stocks, uh, and I know Yemma just said this earlier, but like she likes the healthcare sector. I do too. I think that healthcare, financial, uh, energy, and then defense sector names are going to probably carry here uh, for a little bit. That's just because tech, tech needs to just calm down for a while. Uh, it can't be the leader. It's 100% of the time, uh, leader in is not the leader. The leader coming into a recession into a sell-off like this is not the leader out 100% of the time. So based on that, uh, positioning here is next three to five years, mostly three years, I think three. This is a bet and a hedge on your portfolio. So if you don't have space for this kind of thing, I'm not, recommend I'm not recommended anyway. This is what we're doing. But um, basically, uh, you're betting that the world might be a little bit more unstable. Um, and it can still surprise with that instability. And then, you know, on the other point, it's like, you know, a lot of us, a lot of us in the defense space, you know, focused on counter Russian aggression. We're not surprised by Ukraine. Some folks were, right? And what's why UNG and the National Gas and all those plays that we had early on worked out so so well. Um, okay. And the final point before I actually get into the chart and the names is uh, we won't be heavy on names that will do well, even if uh, there is no continued war. So DOD spending allocations are changing. We want to follow those spending allocations. I'm not calling for or asking for. And I know Sid, Sid uh, calls me out on this all the time. He wants the uh, the White House to turn a different color before he's, he's, he's willing to spend on defense spending. But I'm suggesting that defense spending coffers are realigning anyways. And we can maximize that realignment. So I'm not even asking for total addressable market in defense spending. Uh, so I'm just asking for reallocation to other areas. For instance, areas short of war, that the hybrid warfare zone. Okay. I said a lot, and I'm going to get into the stocks here. So the first one, this is the hardware company, the one that I said hardware is tough. But if you're going to pick one, and you got to pick one, it's going to be Lockheed Martin. Um <laughs> So this is uh, one of those ones where you look at the technicals, which one is the fastest horse and which one has the best technicals. 
I mean, look at this Joker. It's sitting far above where we want it to sit. Uh, and then like the other thing is volume profile. Look at how strong this is. It's been going sideways long enough uh, to actually build a very strong base. I would say that Lockheed Martin, even though you're buying a premium here, I mean, and look, look, um, wow, I wish I would have had this, but I mean, it's been going up. That's the thing, right? Um, I think it's viable now. Or if you really, really want to wait, the next the next place that Lockheed Martin is viable for us is uh, 440, which is this level right here, this yellow volume profile. What, what we expect to see is if it does break down here, which it doesn't look like it will. But if it did break down, if you wanted to wait, you're going to you're going to hit volume profile here and you're going to hit this big kind of band. Uh, and you're also going to um, hit the moving averages at the same time. You're also going to hit the bottom of this regression channel. Uh, which is showing the trend. So all that there is uh, is pretty key to that. So I'm saying if you want a traditional defense sector name, not defense, military defense, <laughs> uh, Lockheed Martin is the one that I would pick. All right, I'm going to kick it to TA double D. You got any questions? Because I'm going real fast here. So No, uh, not at all, actually. I've looked at... You know, I've been looking at these defense companies. I actually just watched a documentary on Lockheed Martin. Okay. And, okay. And right so you now, probably know more than I do. Yeah, right now with everything going on, all these countries are spending more <laughs> on their, you know, defense. I mean, that's, and the U.S. is like the number one seller of whatever, the war stuff. Yeah. Arms. Yeah. It's like, it, it looks good to me. <laughs> yeah. You know, we have... <laughs> Oh man, this is a fun game. I don't know how much I want to say of this. On we we have professional arms dealers uh, that work for the State Department. Um, <laughs> there's a there's a funny title. Everything is titled wrong, right? So you'll never know what they're called. But uh, it's funny uh, because given their billet and given their positioning, they actually they actually should not have that big of a house or that big of of a station in in their the given country that they're in. But based on the title, some of you know who I'm talking about, the title that I'm talking about, but it's based on their title in the State Department. They have the biggest match in always with the biggest pools so they can throw the biggest parties so they can sell the most uh, Scorpion missiles. You know what I'm saying? Like, it's hilarious. And uh, it's something that, you know, I think it's relatively well known. Uh, I hope it is. Uh, but if it's not, then it's it's pr it's just a funny thing that, uh, that we can talk about on a, <laughs> on a later stream. But yes, defense names. Uh, Lockheed Martin, Sid, have you looked at Lockheed Martin? What do you think? What do you think? Just uh, I have not looked at it at all. I think the price tag on it's too high. So um, if, if I would be interested in it, I think at the lower level that you suggested is a, is a good price for it. Um, it's a great company. I do know about it. Um, you know, my background's the same as yours. So um, I know a lot about it. So it's a good company, but it needs to come down lower. Um, I actually went with um, Amer uh, Henry Rifles. That's who I was going to go with with my defensive stock because, uh, you know, without any semiconductor chips and so on and so forth, there's not going to be an army in the world that'll be able to fight anymore. So I went with a repeating rifle and that's what I asked my wife to get me for Christmas and she got me one. So that's just, that's my defense stock. I'm just wow. kidding. When you're ready for me to wow. do, I'm, I'm ready <laughs> <laughs> I was gonna so I was gonna say we're gonna start uh, buying ammo next, uh, but uh, that play. Uh, I got a stupid question. I got a stupid yeah, question. Yeah, so ahead. you military guys, all right? So okay, so Lockheed Martin is a private company okay. that primarily just con contracts to the gov. They're publicly traded for sure. I mean, they're, they're I don't not know, but I know I'm talking. I'm talking just the contracts that they have in terms of the 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 products that they make whether that be uh your airplanes or weapons yeah and this, or the front yeah, office. Why, go, go ahead Kenny. no i was saying this is why i pick them over like for instance boeing because boeing has a lot, a lot of commercial exposure right right yeah so, so the front office mike to answer your question yes they they predominantly sell to us their back office of the guys who Kenny was explaining about earlier, they sell to anybody and that's the highest bid. Okay. So uh, Ryan's okay. here. What is up, Ryan? Happy holidays. Didn't see you there. Another dumb question. Okay. So, um, so is it, um, 
because they just strictly deal with the U.S. government, it is therefore a breach of contract or even like illegal for them to deal. Oh, for sure. Anything. Okay. So yeah, I know what you're asking now. Let me explain this to you. So uh, for instance, the Javelin missile has different. Okay. So like when we have the Javelin missions missile, I'm not going to tell you what number we're on. Cause I don't know if this is like classified or not. I, I don't think it is, but we're on like stage whatever of the upgrades or the updates. Right. If we, and then you're saying, okay, but other countries have Javelin missiles, right? Yeah. Yeah. We sold them those Javelin missiles uh, by proxy, but, those Javel missiles are not stage whatever we have. It's like stage one. You know what I mean? So they don't have like those upgrades. So we always have tactical advantage when it comes to our weapon systems. And then uh, <laughs> the other piece is, hey, because they're programmed by us, <laughs> we could probably turn them off. I'm not saying we can. I don't know. I'm just throwing it out there. I've actually <laughs> For always most things. Because we're that? on like, F-35s and stuff to other countries and what if they're they old. Us, you know? <laughs> they're old. They're old, Tad, or they're missing buttons. <laughs> yeah, if you get my drift. So to, to make it really simple about this. So when I bought my Mustang and I went to Roush and I said, hey, I want you guys to do a stage three mock-up for me. So which would have put mine over the GT500 um, base model. So because I didn't buy it from them directly, I, I could not do that. I could only go as high as a stage two with them. Had I bought it directly, I could do stage three. So that's kind of what Kenny's talking about. Mm. So that, Sir, thank you for... Have have an, got an it. Advantage. It makes sense. So essentially, they're just... Okay, they're they're just not getting the same products. We, we just have an advantage regardless, right? Oh, Anytime yeah. Anytime we sell any... Oh, yeah. We don't sell near peer products. There's no way. Like they have to be second generation at the minimum. We don't usually even sell second generation. It's like sixth generation before we start selling them. So okay. like we're selling F-15s now and that's because yeah. we used them in 1977. You know what I mean? So Okay. So the reason why I asked that question is because <clears throat> the U.S. usually does not export anything. The, the number one products that we export because we're mainly importers. <laughs> Our GDP is like ridiculous. Like the, the our GDP in terms of net exports is always mm -hmm. a net negative, and the only the products that we sell the most of are petroleum and uh, airplanes. And when you say airplanes, it's commercial slash. Mm -hmm. I don't know if they include um, military airplanes, but I assume that it is. And so it makes sense because there's a huge price tag on. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. So. I'm just saying He's like when, when Russia or like China yeah. or whatever, when they have all these like fighter jets or these bombers, and I'm like, man, I wonder, I don't know. You guys know this. I don't think you guys are allowed to disclose any of this stuff. I'm like, how much of the intelligence that goes inside a lot of these uh, jets and these airplanes are manufactured by us? You know what I mean? And so I don't know. That's that, that, that was my ultimate question. Basically, the Iron Man question, right? Like, I don't know if you watched the first Iron Man, but my man was like, he found out Stark Industries was like double dealing, man. And so I'm just wondering if we are. No, I mean, private companies, so private meaning publicly traded or even private companies that sell it to the U.S. government, they will not like, especially weaponized systems. Um Wow, I can't remember the name of the act. I used to know this by by name, by heart, by number. But uh, there's there's a there's essentially a stipulation. There's an actual congressional uh, action that says and states that you cannot sell arms to other countries without first vetting certain things, and then it has to go through a bunch of processes. It's really crazy. Even like for instance, like if you go to an allied country or allied nation, even as a small unit, and you're in a war. Like you can't even sell them ammo or give them ammo. You can't even give them like ammo. Okay. Like this is in full on war too, without like a, a full vetting. Yeah. So it, it's complicated, but just know that like we tend, tend to not, if we do sell yeah. it, we're giving them our scraps. I will just say this just as a, you know, a dumb civilian, <laughs> like the things that I hear about what's going on with this. Okay. So just wars in general, people, there are some, there's some people who are massive conspiracy theorists and um, and even just this idea of the Ukraine uh, Russia war, right? That that was manufactured by us 
to funnel money into this whole Ukraine thing that is actually not even in there. It's funneling it to fund the government to like um, to build more or to have more money to build planes and military or whatever it is. So it, it, I guess the reason why I asked that is the trans, the lack of transparency basically creates this monster of like people who just like, just don't. Well, really I mean, okay. Anything. That's not true. It's very transparent for the people who work in the offices. Right. And those people talk to people like you can find this out, right? That's why journalism is so important. All this stuff is really easy to find out. Freedom of Information Act. You can read the descriptions of like these job titles and these job positions. Some of the agency job positions in the State Department and stuff. Yeah, they're obfuscated. But if you read in between the lines, you can figure it out. Any journalist can figure out what these like positions hold and what they are. So see, I, I don't think you're giving way too much credit, man. I think you're giving way too much. No, credit No, but I'm to saying it's person. it's complete. It's completely transparent for the people who work in it. Oh, yeah. yeah, yeah. So okay. like right now, for instance, right now, a lot of us would probably be like, hey, Apple's making this a car. Apple making a car. There's probably people at Apple, and I don't know this true or false, but I'm saying if Apple was not making a car, they're laughing at you so hard it's not even funny because the right. ground truth is there, and it's super obvious for them. Um, right. But I would even say that that level of NDA and that level of confidentiality is way higher than the threshold for the government. Like the government is way more transparent than a lot of people like to think, you know, like you, you ask folks and I'm, we're going on a tangent. Never mind. Let's, let's get off this tangent. <laughs> yeah. Let, let that? Me here. No, real quick. Like the, here's your top three um, mineral fuels. Oils is number one exporter machinery, including computers is number two. And then electrical machinery equipment is number three and vehicles are number four for our exports. Oh, okay. Maybe I'm looking at outdated data then. That was Damn. the, the, the data. looking at Vietnam West War data, bro? What's that? You're looking at <laughs> Vietnam War data, bro? All right. No, man. I'm looking at two, uh, the data that I share with my kids yeah. is like probably yeah. from like 2020 oh. 20 or 2019. Damn. <laughs> We're going to have to, I'm going to have to go in that school rating uh, website and and drop you down or not, man. Hey, man, it's all right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm a okay, public so employee. It's <laughs> it's gonna be harder. Well, actually, I shouldn't say that. Never mind. <laughs> so the, the uh, <laughs> I see where you're going. So the other name I want to talk to you about is Khaki. So Khaki is kind of a consultant, it's like professional services company. It's what people thought Palantir was doing. Uh, this and BAH, right? So, um. The reason I'm looking at them is look at the price again. The price is telling you everything. The price is up there. It's doing the up there thing. But if you zoom out, uh, Sid, I know this is the kind of chart that you like. This is 2015 back here. Uh, this is 2023 right now. Uh, this is a good chart. I mean, if you're a long-term investor, this chart is solid. Um, I don't think it's a buy now. I want to see a retest of 280, which is around here, which would hit this line right here, right? But if it hits this trend, I mean, this trend has been intact since 2015, uh, even through this recession, through the pandemic, through all this stuff. So I can't see it not uh, sticking the landing here. Um, I mean, as a technical trader, Sid, you look at this chart. This is strong. Everybody knows channel up 90%. Yeah. You can't tell I'm drooling over here. Come on, bro. <laughs> <laughs> gotcha. Uh, anyways. <laughs> BAH is another one. They're trading rich here, but buyable under 96. So 96 is this level right here. Volume profile is slightly below that 95. Uh, the reason I'm saying 96 is you hit this kind of target here, and then this EMA or SMA uh, will match as well, and hopefully you get that bounce. Uh, but Bill's Allen is trading a little rich for sure. We called it out like way, way back here. Um, but I mean, it's made the move and it's made the move like we thought it would. So everything is kind of functioning and falling on all cylinders. And I will kind of go into some of the macro and some of the fundamentals too in a second here to kind of kind of uh, walk the dog. But again, BH, the same kind of, it looks just like this. I don't know if I put it. No, I didn't. But it, it's the same kind of thing over the last, you know, from 2015 to whatever, just solid, solid growth. The margins just keep staying the same. Uh, so here's BAH versus khaki. Uh, I'm just trying to show you what we're looking at right here. Uh, gross profit margins. This is the big one. Remember when I said Lockheed Martin and you're looking like 15% gross profit margins? Uh, it's hard to scale that, right? Um, 23 is actually kind of low for BAH. They do have a lot of systems processes. They probably have a lot of um, inefficiencies here that that I don't know. It, it, it was weird. I was trying to break it down. I didn't, I didn't see anything. I didn't have enough time to break down the full... Uh, 
10K, but uh, khaki, much better uh, margins here. Uh, so again, double the hardware margins. The only other thing that I would look at here in, in terms of like thinking through this is, yes, these are trading uh, very, I don't want to say rich, but they're, they're, they're full. Uh, they're not like cheap stocks. So don't go in here thinking like these are cheap stocks, but you know, sometimes stocks are really cheap for a reason. So in a recession, in, in, in a kind of correction market like we have, you want to see names that are doing the, this, right? These are the strong names. These are the names that no matter what, they go up. Do they do the 90% move? No, but they do go up though. Um, and then kind of finally, there's like, we always talk about alternative data sources here. Um, so I don't know, Sid, if you've ever had a clearance, don't don't say one way or the other, but you know, folks who have clearance go on the website called Clearance Jobs. And clearance jobs are DOD selected clearances, DOD or federal clearances. So it's secret, top secret, TSSCI with poly, all that kind of stuff. Um, the point is clearance is a proxy for defense. So as a data source, all the people who are posting jobs here are posting, looking for folks with clearance. So you can extract that uh, clearance jobs equals DOD jobs, right? Defense sector jobs. They're always like 95% of the time will be defense sector jobs because that's who they have to be the client for, right? Actually, 100% of the time. Nobody else would need a clearance. Okay, what am I saying? What I'm saying is, uh, as expected, Lockheed Martin has 4,000, uh, which is the, the most by volume here. Um, when it comes to security clearance jobs. So if you go to you know clearance jobs and, and you put in your info and everything like that and you have clearance, you can search for jobs. And if you put in Lockheed, there's 4,041 jobs. If you put Booz Allen, slightly, uh, slightly smaller company, obviously, uh, but uh, 2,201 jobs. And then Khaki, uh, for where they are at in market cap relative to Booz Allen, uh, actually has a really strong 1,893. I did not think that at all, especially coming from the things that I look at. Um, but huge intelligence services and IT services company that that uh, that does work for the the defense um, uh, DoD. Anyways, point is 1,893 is actually pretty good. Uh, and then just to make everybody laugh, and, and the folks are say, "Hey, why not Palantir?" You know. <laughs> I always say, well, oh, dear, uh, look, look, bros, 152. But Mike, but Mike, there's more. For all the haters, remember, DOD is Palantir's largest revenue stream. Remember that. It's their largest revenue stream. I even said to give them credit, they need to switch to commercial. Uh, so I think Palantir is still trash for all who kind of want to call me out on that. And then, uh, hey, and I'll short it anytime it gets a life, uh, but I don't think it'll get a life. But, you know, these are little things that is so obvious because, like, you know, the shillers aren't shilling khaki. They're not sh shilling Booz Allen because people don't think it's the next whatever. Right. But fuck, they were shilling Palantir. All you had to do is come here, <laughs> go see how many jobs Palantir is offering. Oh, wait, what? Your market cap is what? And you're where you only have 152 jobs. Oh, that's cute because Booz Allen's hiring 2,201 people <laughs> today. Mm -hmm. So uh, anyways, that's in what we call in the uh, alternative data source, uh, just like your cat hoodies. Um, but I think this one's better. <laughs> Tad, do you have any questions before I hit the uh, go into the next part of this? I do not. You explained it very uh, that well. That means I'm doing a good job, right? Yes, I like yeah. it. You're like my litmus test, bro. Uh, we got anything in the chat? T A double D. Uh, they, uh, well, Ryan's just teasing about how you're always dissing Palantir. Oh, okay. <laughs> You'll notice that, but I like it too. I think it's funny. Ah, uh, well, I mean, <laughs> oh man, Mike changed his name to Jamia to twenty. I like it. I like it. I don't know what you're eating, <laughs> bro, but uh, I think hey, high conviction play. Does anybody know anything about Dash DoorDash? I do. Think about shorting the hell out of that thing. Anyways, <laughs> we'll talk about that later. Unit economics problem. Uh, okay, so qu quick thoughts on khaki. So this is some research that I, I stole from uh, Macro Ops. Uh, those guys are, used to be uh, operators as well. But anyways, uh, they were looking at khaki. Uh, 7% plus free cash flow yield plus 11x EBITDA earnings before interest, taxes, depreciation, et cetera. Uh, and then 14X EPS. Okay, check this out. 
the Carlisle Group bought some something similar, uh, Mantech, which is a much smaller version of Khaki, I would say. Not much, much smaller. Uh, but look, they bought them at 26 EPS uh, and 16 times EBITDA. What am I trying to say? So here, look at this. So they're at 14 times EPS and 11x EBITDA. What am I saying? So right now, if Khaki is worth 100 bucks, I would say if they get bought out by some big name like Carlisle Group, uh, they automatically are worth at least 140, right? So, you know, Khaki might be the play here, might be the play. It ain't Palantir, boys. Uh, anyways. What, uh, what about, is EBITDA? I just like, said it. I don't know. Earnings, I earnings, oh. earnings before interest, taxes, depreciation, amortization. All right. All Ask right. me what amortization is. Ask me. Yeah, what is it? <laughs> My answer. People want to know. Really guy. <laughs> 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 now it's basically um like like for instance you buy a car and um you claim taxes on it like. A thousand this year, a thousand next year. Sid, you should answer this question. You have more businesses than I do. Jesus. Yeah, you're doing a good job. Okay, <laughs> I'll just leave it at that. All right. Uh, so final thoughts on BAH. Uh, the one thing that I'll say, it's the strategic advantage for BAH. This is huge. This is amazingly huge that nobody nobody talks about. Nobody talks about. <laughs> it's just like there's this plat software platform system called Ivana. So if you looked at the SEC def uh, data coordinatization, data modernization memo that was uh, signed off by the assistant SecDef uh, for SecDef. Um, what they said was the platform of record that everything and all data will be used on is Advana. And do you know who owns Advana? BAH. So literally all data modernization, if they have their way in the next five years, so strategic campaign plans, typically three to five years, right? So at least in the next three to five years, all systems will be built on Advana. At least that's what they're saying. You know, there's ways to get around that if there's like innovation going on and some DARPA stuff, but Advana is supposed to be the program of record right now. That's a big deal because, you know, everybody's supposed to consolidate to that. So even if you're Palantir, <laughs> you got to go through that. Uh, to kind of to build the pipes uh, for for like systems within the DoD, you're supposed to. I'm not saying that's how it's going to work because I know there's ways to skirt that, but you're supposed to. Okay. Isn't that the same thing you said about AMD it was going to be in everything? I thought maybe not. <laughs> and look, look here. AMD got to 140. I said it was going to get to 140. Anyway, okay, stop. I said it was going to get to 120. It got to 120. I said it was going to get to 140. It got to 140. I said, eh. And eh. <laughs> I didn't, now I didn't say like it was going to crash down to 67, 68. But I mean, right I'm now, just uh, up, no, I know you are, but it's true. Um, <laughs> there's a lot of headwinds. I did, a, I did an AMD video. If you haven't ch checked it out and you do care about AMD, check it out. I, I'm pretty honest about my assessment. I do think NVIDIA is a good buy now, even with, uh, with AMD as, as far as it, it is now. And I wouldn't have said that uh, last year or two years ago because AMD's missed uh, a little bit here. So, but if you're looking for a really good comedy, that's the video you want to watch this weekend. Kenny and AMD. That's a good comedy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. All right. Uh, can somebody mute Sid? How do we remove? How do we remove? <laughs> <laughs> so, so hey, man. Just to answer your question earlier, I, I, I did have security clearances. Um, they were given to me by my wife. Um, nice. One is to do the laundry, and the other one is to do the dishes after dinner. That's um, but other than that, man, I, I have no security clearances. You know, we're we're not allowed to talk about that stuff. But hey, <laughs> my three stocks. Are a little bit different than yours. Um, when you said defensive, I kind of went in a different direction. I went re I know, recession I know defensive. I know, I know so, what you're saying, and we need that. Yeah, man. So I decided my three for – I've already been nibbling away on these. Um, first one is MPW. I didn't have any charts for it, so if you can load it. That's great. But MPW, it's a self-advised real estate investment trust. It was formed in uh, 2003. Basically, it's uh, buys hospitals. It's gotten crushed along with everything else. Um, I don't think we can see too much more downside on this. Has a great dividend at 10.33%. And um, right now, I believe it owns 
think it's north of 400 and I'm going to guess kind of 430. Right? NPW? NPW? MPW, yeah. Medical, M -M? Oh, medical properties. Medical properties. Should should be around. You gotta, Sid, you got to say Mike Papa Whiskey or else I don't understand. Mike Papa, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Yeah. So that's the one, one of them that we're looking at. Um, it, it's not my favorite, favorite one, but I do like the dividend in it and, and I don't see much more of a downside to it. It's still acquiring hospitals. Um, the other one I like, I don't like it for its dividend. Its dividend is not even 1%, but it's Charlie Papa. Charlie Papa. Before I poke Charlie Papa, this is the Bolero of medical. So it's Charlie Papa. It's 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 pretty much sideways um, as right now, and um, it's uh, the Canadian Pacific Railroad uh, Company. Um, again, I'm not real thrilled about the dividend, but at least it pays something. But as you can see, what's going on since we've been in this downturn, this this company has not really turned down at all. Um, not to say that it might might not um, or will not, but um, I, I think it's a good strong company. My last one that I like is uh, another REIT. It's H Hotel Romeo. Hotel Romeo. It's 6.4% dividend. Um, it's another healthcare REIT. But this one concentrates on more of small medical offices, um, which I'm, I think is going to have an explosion over the next year and or two. But it's at a good place right now. I'm not saying go all in on any of these. Um, but uh, these are the three that we're looking at. And then once the market starts to turn around, um, one of our, we've been in it, we're out of it now, but we've been in it before. Um, we'll get right back into it again. Maybe uh, after um, we see what happens in the first quarter with Apple and some other earnings, we'll make a decision then. But we really like uh, Sierra, Charlie, Hotel, Delta. Sierra, Charlie, Hotel, Delta. Pays about a four percent dividend. I know it's it's a uh, not a beautiful thing, but uh, it, it it's so it's just a good turnaround um, equity. But that those are mine, man. I don't have much more to say on them. You know, you guys know how to get a hold of me through Facebook, or Messenger, or email me um, at my email address. It's easy to find on the website, or I'm sorry, on the internet. Um, I mean, I'll be glad to give you guys some list of what we're looking at moving into the future or some more details on what we're thinking about, as I said earlier, with the silver um, the uh, and also real estate and um, the storage units. Amazing. The only thing I'll say is that last one, what was it, the Charlie Papa or whatever like that? You know, bottom fishing is uh, hazardous, to, hazardous to your wealth, uh, is what I've been told. Um, yeah, oh, the cool. On which one? Not the Canadian Pacific, the one after Canadian Pacific. Oh, HR, Hotel Romeo. Yeah, yeah, that one's a tough one. I it can is. swallow the other ones. That one's a tough. That chart is rough. Yeah, it's a bad chart. Yep. But like I said, we're just nibbling away at it. I like the dividend. The risk, if, if, what's it going to do? Go to zero? They, they have more. They own enough real estate to to pay out. You know, right. I, I don't really fear it that much. Okay. Uh, no, I, I like the the other ones. I was just, you know, my commentary on that is, yeah, that's that's. And I agree with you. Yeah, yeah, I agree with you. Um, Ryan's asking AMD or Jamia. Uh, I'll tell you what, uh, risk to reward. I think you know, hundred percent chance if you're just buying equity, uh, AMD is gonna get back into the eighties. Um, maybe not next year, but I'm saying next year. Um, I have high conviction in that for sure. Jamia. It's a big YOLO at this point. Um, I'm still actually cost averaging in. I mean, my cost base is way too high. So I'm I'm just holding the <laughs> fort here. But $3 looks real good for me. But What's uh, what's too high? Know. What's too high? Let's, 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 <laughs> I'm not going to do that. You're not going to do that. It's higher than yours probably. It's probably higher than yours. Let's just see. Oh, really? Oh, wow. That's maybe, surprising actually. Maybe. maybe. 18? Maybe. That's mine. 18 is mine. I'm trying to think of a way to say this without saying it. <laughs> <laughs> well, you're thinking about that. Uh, Ryan said something about bowling. Actually, oh, yeah. we looked at two bowling alleys this year, and the yeah. new bowling alleys have a lot less um, hands-on, and the yeah. revenue stream is unbelievable, um, yeah. especially drink. with the beer and, beer and the food. It, yeah, you got to bring in the drinks. 
Yeah. And then Fred, Fred, if you could explain maybe a little bit more what you're talking about with Airbnb short also. Oh, you mean the stock itself? Yeah. That's yeah. okay. Gotcha. Yeah, because I was talking about Dash. And so I, th- oh, I, agree. Okay. I agree with them. I think that whole cohort, that whole uh, IPO cohort is going to get trashed real soon. Especially DoorDash, man. DoorDash, the unit economics are so bad, man. They're really, really bad. I did more digging the other day too. And it was just like... I was just amazed that they're still in business and and they're actually if you look at them they're actually holding up real strong relative I mean like yeah this is not holding up strong but a $48 stock that just IPO'd in 2021 during a pandemic it's not going to hold on man it's at 48 bucks it can definitely be cut in half here for sure uh so I'm I'm looking for it to get cut in half. Hey, thanks for that, Sid. Um, we're we're getting ready to finish up here. We're I think this is the last slide actually. We just go into our high conviction plays and see y'all off for the New Year's. Uh, I just wanted to show you this sentiment engine. Nothing outstanding here except for this khaki move. You bought this khaki move and took a strangle, um, or if you went upside, uh, you, you if you put like 10k in, you would have had like 50k. It was ridic- ridiculous. Um, these spikes don't mean as much because Lock- Lockheed Martin gets a lot of uh, media coverage. Booz Allen, again, very, very noisy histogram. I'm only showing you this because like they're still moving up and down without any kind of sentiment. So if you're asking me, is this a sentiment play? It's not. This is a good fundamental play. Uh, and sentiment is not in the way is what I would say. So my high conviction plays, I will start first and then I'll kick it over to you guys. Uh, really, there's only two things that I'm looking at that I'm really sure of. Again, what I said, Tesla needs to uh, contract uh, before um, before this market's done correcting. And I think Tesla still can see 80. So Tesla sees 80. Uh, I think we can turn around here. Um, I mean, I, and it can even see lower than that, but I still think Tesla needs to see 80 or 90. Um, and then the other one is Bitcoin. Uh, or any Bitcoin derivatives, coin, MSTR, Riot, pick them. It doesn't matter. Take these guys. I'm telling you, this is generational. Like I am a hundred percent. Okay, I am a hundred percent sure, which means it's not going to happen. Uh, but I'm a hundred percent sure, and nobody can be a hundred percent sure. So just take this as you will. But as sure as I can be, conviction wise, personally, that uh, Bitcoin is going to get cut in half at least. At a bare minimum, Bitcoin sitting right now at like 17K, uh, I can see it going down to 9,000, like easily, easily, at least, at least, if not 5,000. Um, there's just too many things that's unraveling, System- systemic unraveling is still going to happen. I have leaps uh, on these all day long, either selling premium or actually buying the puts themselves. Uh, I have coin puts, I have bid puts, I have it all. Uh, I think we're going to another crypto winter, and that's not to say that I... I mean, because like, look, when you're the one thing, you're supposed to be the hedge against like loose money, fast money. You're supposed to be the hedge hedge against the Fed. And you became, you went to the dark side, man. Bitcoin went to the dark side. We had a Bernie Madoff moment with SBF. And so because of all that stuff, I don't, I don't see like the reason I would invest in it. You know what I'm saying? Like you invest in Bitcoin because it's not a, it's not an inflationary asset. And here, here's inflation kicking in and, and just all the scumbag money is just pumping and dumping it. And obviously we do know that like huge cohort of the money is in like a very few hands. So we do get that point is it's being sold off. Tesla's being sold off. It's, it's Elon's piggy bank. We're waiting for that little sentiment decline. Talked about it a long time ago. It's like, Hey, n- nobody, nobody likes a billionaire literally except for Elon. Now they don't like him either. So it kind of happened. Um, those are my two high conviction plays. I'm putting my money where my wild mouth is, and that's how I'm playing that. Um, and so I'm gonna pass it to you, Sid. Oh man, I'm going AMD to 35, and uh, Tesla down. <laughs> in the, Tesla's down in the 60s, and uh, I'm not, I, I, you know I, I, I'm being a I little funny about that, that, but I'm, I, in reality, I'm really not. Um, AMD could easily hit 50 bucks. Um, after maybe another bounce up or something, but it could easily hit 50. And if it can hit 50, the next stop is 35 to 40, bro. So Tesla, I, th- I still think that can get down near 60s. I think we'll see. It depends on how bad things are coming around the first quarter. We'll, we'll see. Um, but my bet, I'm still, you know me, I'm the old camp, buddy. I'm still believing that silver and gold or socks are the place to be for 2023. Yeah, no, I, I dig it. I dig it. Thank you. 
T A double D. We're gonna yeah, take man. Take I want to hear tech, bro, dude. What I haven't heard so much from you, what man. What do you want to buy, or what do you want to sell next year? Man, I I, I basically took been staying out of the market just because uh, what everything's going on. Like you guys said, you should have cash. So I I don't really know because I haven't been in the game for a while, a little bit. So I'll be honest. But uh, that's why I'm like taking notes on everything you guys say right now. Yeah, man. He's <laughs> but, buying homes. That's what he's doing. He's buying homes <laughs> and malls and commercial real estate. Well, but, I, was, I, I was actually looking in, uh, like Sid was talking about the, the storage units. I was actually talking to someone I met about doing something like that. I'll give you another quick one, Ted. Uh, look up uh, laundromats because it doesn't matter what the economy's doing. Everybody's got to wash their clothes. That's true. Yep, those those were that was another one we were talking about, or or uh, self serve car wash. I don't know. If oh you know yeah, yeah, that's huge. I was looking at more of basically right now this mortar, you know, natural businesses. I want I want to get more stocks, but right now it's like, man, I don't know what's going on. <laughs> so, I, well, you're doing the right thing. If you're unsure, then you sit on the sidelines. There's nothing wrong with that. Doesn't matter what everybody else is doing. But yeah, right, Mike, was, you're next. Oh, sorry, go ahead, Ted. Oh, I was gonna, I was actually wondering Please. about the Bitcoin thing though too. Like you're saying, it's gonna go down. I kind of mm -hmm. like what Mike said, says about that. You know. Hey, just, Ted, there. remember, just remember, I called it. I called the top in 2017. You didn't believe me. You lost <laughs> a lot of money because you didn't believe me. I just want to remind you that every yeah. time you're here. I'm really good at calling tops on Bitcoin. Like I just know when, when the money's leaving. Mm. And right now people think that the money is all left and it's you can't go any no, it's going to it's going to implode even farther. It's gonna mm. be a winter. This is just the first so, leg, man. Let me let me answer Richard real quick, if you don't mind, because I have experience yeah. with this uranium. So out of all the metals portfolio that I showed you guys maybe a month or two ago, um, uranium, my uranium ETF is the only one that I got my you know what kicked around a lot. Um, but I doubled down and I still think it's going to go up. Um, it, 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 it plays by the, by the whims of, uh, the white house and some other things. And, um, there's uh, a shortage and there's other things going on. Um, you can listen to, uh, Andy, what's his last name? Sh Shekman or something like that. Or, um, uh, Rick rule, um, Richard, either one of those guys talk about the uranium a lot. Um, but that I took a hit on that one. I'm still in it though. Um, but and I did double down. So Sid, I don't know if you know this, but um, we actually interviewed uh, the URG CEO, who's Uranium Baron. Um, <clears throat> anyways, uh, smart guy, very very smart guy. But yeah, it's about the White House. It's about politics. It's about the lobbying situation. But um, Kazakhstan uranium is just too cheap, and it's subsidized, uh, unfortunately. Uh, so right now. You know, it's interesting because, you know, at one dollar, URG has always been a bounce play, bounce play, bounce play. I guess we just wait for URG to hit a dollar and then you can go for your um, CC, uh, CCJ or all those other names and you can like load into those. Right. Because there's more liquidity in terms of if you're an options player. But if you just care about like just buying and holding, I mean, paying for your buck, you know, it's not just because I interviewed him. It's not just because he took the interview. Um, this is a company that knows how to be scrappy too. Like they, you know, when, <laughs> so for instance, they have all these mines, but when, when they don't need to, they'll literally, when the spot price calls for it, they'll buy you uh, uranium off the spot market and then sell it there uh, and just hoard it. And then they don't even have to go to their mines because it's so silly. Right. So it's just an arbitrage play for that. So you have a great CEO at the helm, for this company. I think CCJ is another one that I really like for uranium. I do think that this is a good spot to buy uranium. Um, the only thing I'll say though is, is exactly what Sid said. The White House needs to turn on some of these things and um, we need to just realize that, you know, it's gonna be a longer, longer road to recovery when it comes to all that. So no, I totally agree with what you got to say. It's just a White House thing. We gotta watch for that. But I like these prices. I mean, I know you got your butt kicked, Sid, but I like these prices. I still have some URG. It's not a significant amount, but I mean. So, so Richard, I was, in, and I still am, I mean, URNM, North Shore Global Uranium. Um, and I'll, I'm reading it right from my, my charts here. Um, my I was in for 250 shares. 
Um, my average cost was 65 bucks at the time. I'm down 8,390 bucks before I doubled down, which was a 15.9%. Oh, sorry. Sorry. Um, where is it? Yeah, I don't have the percentage of my loss, but that was a big one. Everything else in my, my metals, everything else is up. My whole metals portfolio, um, I'm, I'm up a little, I'm up about $8,000. Um, as of the original one, I, I've added some more, but so I took a bath with that one. Yeah. Richard's saying everything is on a longer road. Yeah, that's exactly what we're saying. And I think everybody's seeing why the problem is we have to wait out this recession and everybody's got to wait it out. Um, but for sure. Uh, and I think we got to end it with Mike, Mike, you got to give us your high conviction plays. <laughs> and then yeah, that's fine. Uh, my high conviction is I am a short caterpillar. <laughs> there so, it is. Yeah, that's my highest one. Um, so uh, we'll see how earnings go. Um, but I am a very short caterpillar. So hopefully, uh, at least we'll you got you got forty five days of theta or no this time. I'm actually out right now. I'm gonna I'm gonna look for an entry next week because I'm actually pretty bullish short term. So I think we're gonna get a ramp next week. So short um, so, now when it ran, like when it, when you go broke, I go long. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I know. Hey man, I sent you a screenshot, buddy. So no, it was, it was beautiful, my, man. It was beautiful. I got my I first hundo in a while, so it was nice. Um, um, but anyway, all that to say, um, short Caterpillar, I like the company, but it is way, way overbought. Um, yeah. In terms of long, I'm not really long anything other than... Um, I mean, I hate to say it, uh, just because OIH destroyed us. Palantir. Like, <laughs> oh no. <laughs> yeah, I'm I'm long energy right now. I think. Uh, bro, so, uh, bro. Uh, Fred is your boy when it comes to cat. Hit me. I mean, I remember on the live he took some. Uh, yeah. Put still. He's, he's, yeah, he's he on. Did. He's on it, yeah, bro. Yeah, yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. So, so no. yeah, we'll see. Uh, and then. Um, yeah, like I said, I'm selling rips. So any rips uh, next week we ramp, I'm gonna be shorting it. So, but Good stuff, um, man. yeah, that's it. You want me to take it out? Yep. Uh, we right. went way over time. Yeah. But let's get way to end the year. Mike, instead of you taking it out, we have a special guest, the man of the people, T A W D is on. And you oh know yeah, that's right. He takes What's us out. When, when the T A W D is on, <laughs> he takes us out. Takes us out, brother. All right. Well, hey guys, thanks for uh, watching. Red Cliff Research. We got the whole family here. Wanting, we all want to wish you happy holidays. Have a new year, a prosperous new year. That's how we're gonna start it. So until next time, we'll see you later. Bye. Take care, everybody. Happy New Year's, everybody. Mm -hmm.